Hi everyone, we'll just wait a couple of minutes for everybody to join. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Jess. I am a project assistant at Scrap Weapons and a diplomacy student at SOAS University. It's really great to have you here today to launch the second of our webinars, looking at the rise of US-China nuclear tensions. Um, today, we are honored to be joined by three fantastic speakers who will share their insights on the different media perspectives surrounding um, the US-China tensions. Um, just before we start, I will run through um, a little housekeeping. So the webinar is being recorded and will be published on the Scrap YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Um, once all speakers have given their presentations, we will open up the floor for an audience Q&A session. Please add your questions via the Q&A function. If possible, it would be great to have your name and your affiliation, and you can start leaving questions right now. Um, so I will now hand over to my colleague Jack to introduce himself and Scrap Weapons. Hello everyone, I'm Jack Cinnamon, Project Assistant at Scrap Weapons, uh, former Development Studies student at SOAS, uh, new start at the Corruption Tracker. Um, so Scrap Weapons aims to reframe the debate around disarmament and to challenge the dominant strategic culture of production, trade and supply of weapons that inevitably fosters new wars and which has a direct on safety and development conditions of critical areas of the global south. The trade of global war looms, yet there is no practical strategy for weapons control. Scrap advances the disarmament agenda by way of providing the international community with both intellectual and practical tools for its implementation. These include a draft treaty for the realization of the legal commitment to nuclear and general disarmament in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation non Treaty and prototypes of a global weapons tracking system that provides transparency against illicit arms trafficking. At SCRAP, we are now working to organize a conference on activating a fourth special session on disarmament at the United Nations General Assembly to be hosted at SOAS University of London in September. UN special session devoted to disarmament were held in 1978 and 1982, and also in 1988, but a fourth never, never transpired. We aim to build a global constituency to revive the debate on general and complete disarmament at the United Nations General Assembly in the near future, and we invite everyone to participate and support our work. We believe it is important that the debate around disarmament is not ignored by academic and policy experts, and that it is promoted at the agenda of foreign policy makers and think tanks worldwide, both intellectually and in practice. Scrap Weapons invites collaborations to support these processes. You can find more information on our website at the link that will be posted in the chat. So this, so for the webinar today, we'll focus on today, uh, so we will focus, oh sorry, we will consider different media perspectives on Sino-American relations, uh, narratives portrayed in the media can have a direct impact on policy making and on the evolution of a potential arms race. In particular, China's perspectives on the debate around the so-called US-China Cold War have not been adequately represented in Western media. We wish to provide space for reflections and look forward to hearing the insights presented by our illustrious speakers. Uh, thank you, Jack. So um, now I will introduce our first speaker, um, Naveen Sheffers. So Naveen is a senior researcher in the Swiss and Euro-Atlantic security team at the Center for Security at ETH Zurich. She is also the co-editor of the policy brief series, CSS Anal Analysis in Security Policy. 
Before joining the CSS in 2020, Naveen worked at the London-based think tanks, the Interna International Institute for Strategic Studies and VERTIC on non-proliferation and nuclear policies. Naveen Shepard's presentation will focus on the narrative around China's nuclear expansion and China's participation in arms control regimes. Ms. Shepard, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess, for the introduction. And thank you to, to Scrub for having me and for organizing such an interesting series of webinars. So uh, as Jess mentioned, I mostly work on uh, nuclear arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament issues. So that's the lens uh, I've taken to examine a little bit how information on China's nuclear weapons program has evolved in the last five years mostly, how this has been portrayed and discussed in public settings among experts, officials and the media and sort of what has driven a change in attitude, narrative and threat perception. So as a quick uh, preface, I will just note that while my focus is very much entirely nuclear, it's of course clear that the, the changing narrative on China is much broader in scope. It builds on Chinese Western actions and reactions in a, a much greater number of fields. So this is not occurring in isolation. And from a, a Western perspective, it's very much also built into uh, a US refocus on the, the Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, uh, to use a less politically charged term. Um, so providing a little bit of background, I would say that knowledge and analysis of China's nuclear weapons program, doctrine and intentions in the West is mostly relegated through a US perspective. So through US policy officials, so in the form of uh, DOD, Department of Defense reports, uh, US intelligence reports, US think tanks and academic circles, uh, especially open source research provided by a growing number of analysts, um, and also through uh, interactions with uh, Chinese experts, but often in or through initiatives that are promoted or funded by the US. So this is not exclusive, obviously, uh, and coming be, being based in Europe, this is, again, European perspective a little bit, but I, I would say it's important to note. Um, and before 2018, um, these discussions, I would say, were often relegated to a more expert, academic, official circles, so often track two, track 1.5 level discussions and interactions in multilateral forums. And I'd say a main reason was that despite some ongoing concerns regarding China's uh, nuclear arsenal, which I'll elaborate in a minute, China still has a significantly smaller nuclear arsenal, has a minimal deterrence posture and a no first use policy, which I think mostly balanced out some of the more general concerns expressed in the expert community. So there's also the fact, of course, that China is not the only nuclear weapon state modernizing its forces. And so I'd say before 2018, uh, arms control efforts still remain quite focused on US, the US and Russia, and disarmament efforts still looked at all five nuclear weapon states or all nuclear possessor states without necessarily singling out China necessarily. So what changed? Um, I'd say that bringing China's nuclear program into a much more public eye occurred when President Trump and his administration started to, to call on China to join trilateral arms control efforts from about the end of 2019 and then more intensively through 2019 and 2020. So while it may seem, I think, uh, in a more public setting, if that this sort of came out came out of the blue, it actually did build on a number of existing issues. So some longstanding, some evolving. So these different factors uh, include China's modernization efforts since the 1980s uh, with the fielding of uh, more numerous and more diverse nuclear weapon systems. So these have included more maneuverable land-based systems, more road mobile ICBMs, progress towards multiple independent reentry vehicles, moving also from liquid to solid fuel delivery systems. So it's been an ongoing program. It's also been, of course, the growth of China's arsenal of dual capable intermediate range missiles, which combined with the co-location of conventional and nuclear systems has raised a lot of ambiguity and poses some miscalculation risks that have been, again, voiced by uh, experts and officials. It's also been the diversification in the types of uh, platforms uh, used by China, so mainly based on the developments of its uh, nuclear powered ballistic missile submarine systems. And since 2018 as well, there's been a, a newly reassigned nuclear mission for the PLA Air Force. So effectively, 
uh, building around this nuclear triad. Um, and then since 2016, we've also seen a potential uh, switch from a more lower alert status to a potential launch on warning nuclear posture that's been discussed, I think, in China and relegated in these discussions a lot. So this would be a departure from uh, China's more, as I say, uh, peacetime alert status of its nuclear weapons, and also with the understanding that China keeps its uh, warheads demated from missiles. Then finally, out of the five uh, recognized nuclear weapon states under the NPT, China has also been the least transparent in terms of its nuclear forces, but also its fissile material production. So the US and Russia through treaties and through verification mechanism have had to disclose a lot more information and France and the UK have unilaterally uh, disclosed a lot more information than China has. So. All these factors are not new, so they have been discussed by the expert community and officials for years, sometimes decades as well, with some increasing concern. And I would say that their combination, along with the possibility, I think, for the Trump administration that pointing the finger at China was at times quite a, a convenient distraction from a, a lack of progress uh, or success in some other nuclear-related negotiations so with Iran or North Korea or also with Russia, uh, made, made it quite convenient. So. Another factor to mention as well was the end of the INF Treaty, the Intermediate uh, Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which, while being the result of years of Russian non-compliance, the fact that it was a completely bilateral treaty and did not include China's growing arsenal of intermediate range missiles was also uh, a concern that grew over the years and was also even apparent at the time the INF Treaty was negotiated in the, the 1980s. So, um, so in these last several years, I'd say there's been then two shifts in the analysis and perception of China's nuclear program, as reported by uh, government officials, experts, and the media. So this first shift occurring uh, throughout 2019, more specifically, as President Trump's exhortations for China to join so-called trilateral arms talks grew. And so my assessment from having followed these debates uh, and also the numerous articles, op-eds, think tank events that took place at the time was that say, the narrative was uh, generally divided or discussed in two different camps. So one camp, including a lot more conservative voices, agreeing with the need to, to put the spotlight on China and calling out Beijing's consistent refusal to join these talks as proof that China is indeed intent on doubling, tripling, quadrupling, whatever its arsenal, uh, and that its intent is to enter into a direct nuclear competition with the US. The solutions put forward by this more conservative camp has usually been the need to for the US to deploy more weapons, to increase the number of systems, and to actively take part in this competition. I'd say the second camp um, brought together brings together a lot more moderate voices that uh, highlighted the fact that uh, calling out China to join these talks was not necessarily the appropriate setting, given the focus at the time was still on renewing, for instance, oh, sorry, extending the New START agreement, and also highlighting that China has participated uh, increasingly in non-proliferation discussions, starting from the early 1990s, and there, there have been slow but existing dialogues at track 1.5, track 2 level, uh, and also some progress at the P5 level, so the forum that brings together the five uh, nuclear weapon states. So needing to actually build on these existing initiatives rather than pushing them entirely aside and calling for something that's not necessarily reasonable at this time. I would say that this moderate camp did not deny ongoing concerns and the lack of transparency from Beijing, but the solutions that were pushed forward were, were to find more ways to enter into a direct dialogue with China and with Chinese officials in particular, given the lack of track one level discussions, and to also focus more on nuclear risk reduction measures, confidence building measures, I think something that has been uh, taken up a little bit more by the Biden administration, for instance. So there's obviously a lot of nuance in these views. These are not too clear cut camps, uh, but I would say that there was still a, a general consensus though, that despite Trump's methods being not necessarily adequate, the fact that he did point this out, that he did put a finger on this important and growing issue, 
uh, that had to be dealt with in a more straightforward manner was still, I think, generally accepted even by the moderate camp. And then there's been a um, second shift, I'd say, starting uh, last year, so early, mid 2021, which mostly I think uh, in the in a more public setting uh, took place because of revelations uh, by several US based analysts that China has been in the process of constructing hundreds of new missile silos. So providing a lot of credence to past uh, defense, US defense intelligence agencies assessment that China is looking at doubling perhaps its nuclear weapons. Um, and so this, these revelations I think have led the, the more moderate camp to, to heighten its concerns, to push for a little bit more urgency in these talks. This has also been combined with, I'd say a lot more public demonstrations on China's end so for instance, President Xi uh, in March 2021 last year has declared that there's a need to accelerate the construction of an advanced strategic deterrent. So there's a, a more pessimistic turn, I think, in uh, public analyses of China's nuclear intentions. It also doesn't particularly help that at the time, uh, interactions between expert communities and officials are quite low and COVID is only partly to blame, I'd say. There has been a more general hardening of Beijing's positions across a number of issues, which has been reflected in communications by the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs and by government representatives in online settings, for instance. Um, there's also been the fact that Chinese uh, English language media, namely, of course, the Global Times, has published a number of articles uh, calling on China to significantly expand its arsenal and dismissing, I'd say, a lot of the more uh, uh, dialogue-based approaches. So to finish on a slightly more positive note, though, uh, I would say that there is a little bit of hope follow following uh, the, the phone call between Presidents Biden and Xi that occurred in November that there might be some progress on establishing a much needed uh, bilateral strategic dialogue. Although the framing of it has been extremely vague, is absolutely not settled. So when this dialogue takes place, if it takes place, um, it will still be very, very slow progress. There'll be, I would say, a, they will need to take a lot of time to go past a lot of mutual accusations. Um, and during that time, very little progress can be expected. But uh, what we have seen occurring, I think, at the P5 level in particular is a bit more positive. Um, perhaps not entirely uh, concrete. And uh, the fact that the uh, Non-Proliferation Review Conference has been delayed on several occasions consistently brings pushes these efforts a bit backwards as well. But that's, I think, the positive note I would like to, to end my remarks on. And I look forward to hearing what my fellow panelists have to say and to all your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Naveen. Um, yeah, that was very, uh, that was an enlightening sum summary on uh, especially the shift uh, in China's nuclear military program um, and why there's a, a spotlight on them at the moment. And, a little glimpse into the future uh, of China's advance or, or China advancing their uh, data terms. So thank you very much. Um, our next speaker uh, is uh, Brad Brad Glossman. Um, Brad is deputy director and visiting professor at the Tama University Center for Rule Making Strategies and senior advisor for Pacific Forum. He is the English language editor of the journal of the New Asia Research Institute in Seoul. His opinion pieces and commentary regularly appear in media around the globe, and he has written dozens of monographs on US foreign policy and, and Asia security relations. Uh, a big shout out to Brad, actually, he's joining us from Japan, and it's almost midnight. So, um, so yeah, uh, so very well done. Thank you a lot, Brad, and the floor is yours. Great, um, thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot of ground to cover. I will probably be cryptic um, insofar as I won't go into a lot of detail, but I wanna throw out food for thought. Let me offer you 
my a quick introduction on my take. As you can tell, I'm an American. Uh, I'm a journalist. I've been doing commentary in newspapers for over 30 years. Um, the, the, uh, uh, weekly columns for God knows how long. Uh, and I've been a policy person working on these issues for over 20 years, particularly nuclear uh, related issues. I ran one of those dialogues that uh, Naveen was mentioning that track 1.5 and track two uh, sponsored by the US government. Uh, we've been focusing on nuclear issues, primarily US-China strategic relations and extended deterrence questions related to Northeast Asia. Um, if you're interested in that, if you go to the Pacific Forum website, there are lots of reports. What I've done in my comments is sort of broken the topic into three sections, disarmament, uh, US-China relations in the media. And let me offer some, again, quick cryptic thoughts on each to just sort of uh, inflame sensibilities and make everyone mad at me. Um, on regarding disarmament, number, four, number one, I would, I would say um, it's a pipe dream. I think there are more countries today interested in acquiring nuclear weapons than eliminating them. And we're seeing, I think in Northeast Asia in particular, a very real chance of a proliferation cascade. Uh, I think North Korea watched Pakistan acquire nuclear weapons and, and uh, cross the threshold. And I think just as similarly, Iran is watching what North Korea is doing and the ultimate disposition of its status and legitimacy of its nuclear capabilities will be a benchmark for other countries. If North Korea, if its nuclear weapons are legitimized, I think you will see, and I'm very sad to say this, but I would not be surprised to see both South Korea and Japan follow suit. Taiwan would, with of course, all of the particular caveats and problems that go with it. And similarly, if you were to see, I think an Iranian nuclear capability, uh, then I think you would just as easily quickly see perhaps similar dominoes fall in Saudi Arabia, Turkey. Turkey. Uh, quite frankly, it's, it's a very depressing sort of outlook. Um, that said, I'm a big fan of the disarmament conversations. I think we need a vocal community to extend the dialogue, to move the center of debate, and to make sure that we have people that are pursuing an aspirational position on all of this. I, uh, good luck. I, I admire your energy and enthusiasm, but I just have a feeling that you're, um, it's, it's a bunch of windmills uh, that, that you're, you're tilting against. Second conversation is on, or my second angle deals with the US-China. Uh, number one, you know, it's sort of as a bridge uh, you know, the Chinese position on disarmament uh, has always been that they're not really prepared to engage in arms control and reductions until the Americans and the Russians cut down to their levels. We've been getting close to that with the new START agreement. The Chinese still, because of the lack of transparency, we don't know how many weapons the Chinese have. The Chinese won't tell us. But they've insisted that they are continuing, they're committed to their strategic posture and will not race to uh, parity if the Americans were to lower their weapons levels to a level at which it would be possible, although it's increasingly doubtful given the changes, particularly that Naveen had just outlined, there's some larger questions evolving. Um, the Chinese, I think, are uh, quite concerned about uh, strategic stability these days. It, the, in all the conversations that we've had over the last decade, quite in fact, uh, the Chinese, and in recent attempts as we've tried to talk about these issues uh, to resume, the Chinese have focused on mutual vulnerability. All the while, you know, expecting that the Americans would extend the same level of respect and understanding of Chinese nuclear prerogatives as they gave the Soviets and the Russians. Uh, this is at the same time that China insists that the Cold War is different, that nuclear weapons aren't central to the relationship with the United States, but uh, that seems to be changing for many of the reasons that Nadine uh, identified. I would take slight issue, by the way, with her comment or characterization of the prioritization and attention given to nuclear weapons. I'm not so sure that the, the, the Trump administration necessarily instituted a shift in this context, but rather what you really saw was just, I think, a, a larger shift in the center of gravity and the nature of the relationship with China. And as a necessary piece of that, the nuclear relationship became engaged and otherwise uh, a, a subject of conversation and just of necessity, uh, it became part of, a, of, of this new uh, conversation. Um, we, one of the reasons, you know, I said we, I ran one of, the, again, a common theme in the conversations that we had with the Chinese was a desire on the part of the Americans to promote a track one dialogue. And to be very honest with you, the dialogue that we ran has been in abeyance for a couple of years because our funders were of the opinion that the Chinese were using that as a way of avoiding having a conversation at the official level. And that, uh, unfortunately, is the belief that's occurred, that spread through uh, some of the highest levels of the U.S. government, the Pentagon, the National Security Council, and State Department. And so consequently, uh, there is a, a belief and, and quite a real bit of frustration that the, these other dialogues, as important as they are, being used as a way of fending off 
the American or, uh, or concerns of other countries to engage at this level. The Chinese, as we talk in, in more recent conversations, still suggest that a track one conversation is not going to happen, but they are prepared to talk more about crisis management as the real subject for which they are most interested as we discuss uh, nuclear weapons. Um, you know, I, I talked about the, I, the, the greater inclination now towards acquiring nuclear weapons than eliminating them. And I would say that the Chinese position historically and to this day actually has validated that particular belief because the Chinese argument has always been that we need nuclear weapons to avoid being subject to nuclear coercion and nuclear blackmail. And that of course is the position that's being used by states like North Korea. I think the Iranians probably have a slightly different approach to that, but nevertheless, the South Korean, or sorry, the, the Chinese rationalization and logic has uh, I think uh, been echoed and it certainly gives some support for some of these proliferating countries, even though I know that the Chinese are not terribly happy about nuclear proliferation. But um, if we address the priorities on something we can talk about that the Chinese, I think, are not as prepared to go as far as some other countries in stopping and rolling back the spread of weapons as, as perhaps the United States might be. The result of all the changes I think that Naveen identified has been a US readiness to, uh, or a sense of obligation to modernize its nuclear arsenals because its principal arms adversaries, China and Russia are doing the same. And so uh, I think, you know, there, there's been a, a slow roll of this. And the United States is, has for the last decade been really one of the laggards when it comes to nuclear modernization efforts. So, um, you know, you, this is, and I think this is being driven to some degree by an action reaction cycle, but there's certainly a, a sense of which the Americans are playing catch up uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with the nuclear modernization programs. Um, finally, let me mention really quickly uh, the media war. And I would just say, number one, it strikes me that nuclear weapons really aren't a big part of the media conversation. Um, certainly not in the bilateral context, just because I don't think we're thinking about that that much in anything except in a few small corners of the Pentagon in the, in the, in the E-ring and uh, perhaps in a couple of folks in think tanks in Washington. Um, but for the most part, in the larger strategic conversation, the, the, I would argue that the, the media system, while yes, Naveen is right that we get so much information from the West, I would argue that the actual flow of information is really far more from the East to the West, that we have far greater penetration in the West of Chinese views than we have of Western views within the Chinese media ecosystem. And I think that that's um, a, a curiosity and, and, and uh, uh, changes the larger you know, media dynamics. And the second point, I make, and I think it's more broadly applied to the nature of the US or the, the China Western competition. And I was in a conversation this morning where I wanted to make to emphasize this point. There is an inclination to frame this as the US and China. And I think that that as, as an American, I've chafed against that for years. I think that does us a disservice because in the sense that this competition is about a uh, institutionalization or protection of an existing global order it isn't the US and China, it is in fact the West as a whole broad body of countries that are, that are um, uh, if you will, competing with a, 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 a much smaller group of nations of which China is the largest. The United States is the largest, but I think there's greater parity between the US, its allies, et cetera, and partners. And consequently, uh, I would prefer to call this China versus the West or if you'd, if you'd rather liberals versus illiberal. Uh, the democracy piece makes me a little nervous because of uh, the, the, the malleability of that particular word. But the point that, I, that that's key here and where I wanna leave you is, is that we're living in a world and in, in an age in which there need to be um, some very fundamental revisions in the global order. And that's a fascinating conversation of its own. But I think what the West is recognizing at this moment that many of the assumptions that it has used, and this goes to the question of narrative and how the narrative is constructed and discussed, discussed are really outdated. We're facing a quite formidable challenge or one that we've never had to face before. The China challenge is fundamentally grossly different from that of the, of the Cold War. And I think that the, the West has presumed the superiority of its values, its ideas and its system in ways that would be make obvious, if you will, the appropriate answer to questions about which system is better and which should prevail. And I think all of those, like I said, the values, the ideas, the systems, those are all subject to challenge now. And I think we need to, to, to question the, you know, and, and we are engaged in a genuine debate now for the first time in 70 years about really institutional orders. And we have got to frank, quite frankly raise our game to make a better case for the answers that we offer to the world about superiority or preferred outcomes 
and preferences in, the, in regard to the way the world should work. And we're doing, quite frankly, a very poor job of that. And with that, I, I think I'll, I'll wrap it up and leave it to uh, wait to hear some more comments and, and uh, resume the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Brad. That was really, really eye-opening. And yeah, great to remember just how much, I think, yeah, it's easy to isolate America in this, but again, it's the West as a whole collectively. And yeah, I think it's really interesting to think about, yeah, the penetration of Eastern values into Western media. And I also wonder how accurately they are then transmitted through the different media. I think that's another interesting point to be raised. Um, so finally, I'll pass over to um, Bo Weixing, um, who is um, a former worker at the People's Daily and um, is currently um, in China right now. So um, the floor is yours, Bo Wei. Yeah, okay, so let me share my screen at first. Uh, okay, can I see? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Bo Weixing from CNSD. So as and it's my honor to make a presentation here today. Uh, my presentation topic is about what do China's, Chinese media think about the new Cold War and comes race. Uh, before I start my presentation, let's see a set of data at first. Recently, data from an article by the University of South California titled Through Chinese Eyes pointed out that in China, 62% of people have no favorable or even very unfavorable views of the United States, while only 37% have a favorable impression of the United States. But in 2016, 50% of Chinese respondents had a favorable impression of the United States. The data shows that the measure of the United States in the eyes of Chinese is gradually changing. And in fact, there are many factors that affect the measure of the United States in China's eyes. <laughs> but there is no doubt that the so-called new Cold War and the United States and the arms race were important factors. Also, there are uh, there are also the new focus of Chinese media when discussing Sino US relations in recent years. So therefore, in my speech today, uh, we'll focus on discussing how the Chinese media will be the Cold War and the arms race in Sino US relations. Uh, firstly, I think we need to understand how the Chinese government will see the United States. As the two of the glo uh, global great powers, China and the United States, will <coughs> inevitably have some competitive relationship with each other. The ideological differences between China and America have also intensified the com competition relationship. Although China uh, has always stated that they want to speak, uh, seek peaceful development, this doesn't mean that there will be no conflict and com competition between China and the United States, especially in some diplomatic issues. China needs to have more voice in order to ensure its own interests, for example, the Taiwan issue and the Middle East issue. In other words, the tension between China and the United States is not just a trade conflict, but a political issue. And this problem is very clearly reflected in the arms race. Uh, next, let's turn to focusing on Chinese media. Although the Chinese media doesn't affect the communication between China and America at the government level, the expression of the Chinese media when discussing sino US relations cannot be ignored either. In fact, the measure of the United States in the eyes of the Chinese is largely influenced by the media. According to a previous statistic on Weibo, which is one of China's largest public social platforms, only about 7% of users have an undergraduate degree or higher degree. This means that in China, most citizens have not very culturally qualified and they do not have a strong ability to think independently. This also leads to their ideas being easily influenced by the media. Uh, in other words, the United States in the eyes of Chinese media and 
not only represents how Chinese view the United States, but also determines Chinese views to the United States. In China, state media such as People's Daily and CCTV dominate public opinion. These state media are often influenced by the government and traditional values, and they evaluate, uh, their evaluations of the United States are mostly neutral. However, uh, there are also lots of private media in China which have nothing to do with the Chinese government. Uh, many of these media are somewhat extreme when looking at civil rights relations. Some of them have a habit of overly advocating America and denying China's efforts. The other, of, uh, the other part of them, however, likes to belittle the international status of the United States and the merits of the United States in many aspects and exaggerate the strengths of China. This has also led to a phenomenon when we discuss how the Chinese media views in civil US relations. We will see many different viewpoints and ideas. Okay, this picture comes from the personal social media of Zhao Lijian, a very well known Chinese foreign ministry spokesman. He mentioned the Chinese Vice Ministry, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Le Yucheng's views on the new Cold War between China and America. They think that China and the United States should look to the future together rather than the reward to Cold War, uh, Cold War patterns. Zhao mentioned he, uh, in his Weibo that China doesn't want any war, be it a hot war, a cold war, or a new Cold War. But the U.S. is still using the Cold War mentality to deal with civil U.S. relations. China doesn't agree with this idea and hopes that China and the United States can work together to develop toward the future. Uh, in addition, one of China's most prominent state media, People's Daily, also expressed uh, its views on the new Cold War by commenting on the Innovation and Compet uh, Competition Act issued by the United States in 2021. In the comments of People's Daily, they also believe that the United States overly promoted the China threat theory, which is different from China's development philosophy. The People's Daily commented that they hope America can correct its maturity and views China's development objectively and rationally. Such views also represent how Chinese state media view the uh, new hope war between China and the United States. China's state media st uh, stated that they do not want China and the United States to enter a new Cold War model, but hope that China and the United States can develop peacefully together. I also searched some Chinese private media's views on the more in civil rights relations, most of which came from the uh, videos they released. Uh, but due to the time constraints, I didn't add these videos to my presentation. But judging from these videos, although different media have different views on whether civil rights relations have entered a new Cold War, but all of them have agreed that China wants a, a peaceful development rather than a new Cold War with the United States. Okay, another topic of Chinese media concerns is the arms race. On this topic, China's state media and uh, private media have different views. In recent years, the United States has spent less and less on defense affairs, while China's spending has gradually increased. Although China still spends less on defense than America, there is no doubt that the gap between the, uh, the two is gradually narrowing. So in this case, the arm race between China and the United States has also begun to receive media attention. In um, fact, however, sorry, oh, yeah. can I, sorry, can I interrupt? I don't think we can see the PowerPoint. Um, would you be able to reshare the PowerPoint? Yeah, okay. Sorry about this. Stopped moving. Okay. Oh, uh, can you see it now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's continue. In fact, however, ten, uh, Chinese state media rarely publishes comments on the arms race between China and the United States. 
uh, in an article published in 2012, the People's Daily mentioned that China would not participate in any kinds of arms race. Although this is an article from 10 years ago, uh, but it also represents the view of China's mainstream media on the arms race. The Global Times, an international news outlet in China, also expressed similar views on the Sino US arms race. China has no intention of launching an arms race with America. China only wants to ensure its own security against threats uh, through nuclear weapons. So, however, although China's mainstream media has indicated that China has no intention of any arms race, there are still many private media who believe that an uh, arms race between China and the United States is foregone conclusion. Hu Xijin, the chief editor of Global Times, said on his personal social media that China needs more nuclear weapons to deal with the United, uh, United States threat. He believes that peace is not obtained through prayer, but requires strength. China can choose not to take the initiative to participate in the arms race, but China cannot give up its military strength just because it doesn't participate in the arms race. And another Chinese uh, unofficial media outlet, Jia Guo version, made a similar view that China should not worry about arms race, uh, although I don't fully agree with the point mentioned in this article. And in a word, the traditional Chinese thought is uh, harmony is the most precious. Chinese media generally believe that China will not participate in any form of war, especially in the so-called new world war. In addition, Chinese, uh, Chinese state media have also expressed their view that China will not take their initiative to join the arms race. Although many of China's private media are expressing that China should improve its military strength, to deal with uh, potential arms race and new cold war. But in essence, they are also uh, they are they are also opposed to the new cold war and arms race. Okay, that's all. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Bowie. Uh, yes, thank you. Again, uh, yeah, very insightful. Uh, we don't often hear uh, too much. Uh, from different sources uh, in Chinese media, um, especially the difference between state media and private media as well. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so now we are going to move on to the Q and A. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, yeah. So we have a few questions actually. Um, so I think what we should, uh, sorry, I'll probably go with Bowie first, uh, if that's okay. Um, so what are your thoughts? Do you think that the media can ever have a positive impact on the summit goals? And, and then we can um, move on to the next speaker. What do you think, Bowie? Uh, sorry, Jack, I can't hear you clearly. Uh, could you speak uh, slowly? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, do you think that the role of the media can ever have a positive impact on disarmament goals? Oh, well, in China, the media have, um, let me see how to say. The media can uh, maybe, I mean, it uh, determines what people think in some aspects in China, yeah. And I'd like to move, move the uh, same question onto Brad. Uh, you were quite skeptical before about uh, the summer being a, a topic in the media. Um, do you think that in an opposite uh, frame, the media can be a positive force uh, in the disarmament agenda? instead of being uh, what you say, 
sort of not really um, at the forefront of the of the debate. I think in issues like this, the media tends to to, to follow rather than leading. Uh, I think certainly in the United States context these days, the uh, questions like this are just so unbelievably divisive politically that I think that it would be very difficult for the media to have a, a reach that extends to you know, the broad mass of the, of the, of the voting and, and thinking public. I think it would just be playing to certain bubbles of the population. So, uh, but again, that's not to say that as always, I think it's really important that the media and the advocates make their case and continue to try to shape the debate, even though if you're as pessimistic as I am about the ultimate impact, I think you still have to give voice to those aspirations and try to influence the larger evolution. So, you know, keep going, just don't expect to have a huge impact. That's Brad and Naveen. I think giving a bit of a perhaps European perspective is uh, discussions on disarmament in the media in Europe really do vary from country to country. The importance given to them based on, uh, I think, belonging to, to NATO or not, on how these issues are discussed at a parliamentary level. But I would tend to agree with Brad as well that often it is still a more reactionary than leading or leading the debate. Uh, in Switzerland in particular, uh, you have it mostly following a uh, parliamentary agenda at times. And so in countries like France, uh, disarmament questions still have also a very strong perception that they are uh, more of an activism issue, that they are not part of the mainstream or don't necessarily uh, um, respond to, to defense or uh, to, yeah, to defense imperatives necessarily. So it does vary a lot in Europe, I would say, country to country. But at the moment, it's it's quite difficult, I think, uh, in COVID times as well. It's just also been really relegated to the the end of the, the agenda uh, when technically it is possible to, to link these issues, I think, a, a lot better with um, other problems. So I don't know if that answers fully your question. Um, just a real quick thought. It occurs to me that, um, you know, the, the problem with the mass discussion is, is that the discussion with nuclear, for most, particularly for Europeans, when we talk about nuclear stuff, it tends to be nuclear energy rather than nuclear weapons. And I'm afraid that that, that, that kind of blurring of the lines doesn't necessarily help the disarmament agenda. Um, and that's rather simplified, I, I grant you, because Naveen's looking at me skeptically, but I still think that the, for the most of the public, it is not the weapons, not the defense issue, but the energy and the climate issues that which could be changing that dynamics to some degree. I would, if I can quickly respond, I would think there has been a bit of a shift, though, or at least a change, uh, mainly driven by a lot more discussion on the the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons in various European countries. So there has been that a little bit more of a the, dividing the the weapons from the the energy topics and it's been a bit more present so uh yeah thank you um yeah we have another question as well um so in his presentation um boy mentioned that seven percent of um only seven percent of the chinese public have a degree in critical thinking um and we have a student here from the political communications um degree and they're asking um, whether, um, in other words, whether the um, the public opinion is able to um, criticize the media in the sense that why has the narrative pushed in the the media? Is that criticized by um, the the public, and are they able to respond to that? So, um, Brad, if I'm the Chinese media critic. Um, I, I, the, um, I think there are limits to how far the public discussion goes in the Chinese media. But, and the general perception of course is, is that the limits are set by the political leadership and thus it tends to direct the debate. That said, public opinion is not to be scoffed at and to be dismissed. It is an, a very important factor and there's a certain limits. I think the problem tends to be that, that um, the public opinion in China uh, pushes the government in certain directions uh, and that it uh, 
is obliged to take into account. So it's never quite a, a simple you know, model, if you will, of just saying the, the, the flow goes in one way, uh, usually from the top down. But uh, I think that there are certain subjects of which the political, the, the, that, the, the conversation is directed that way. But in many other ways, it, there is definitely a, a real weight given to this uh, opinion and how far, how quickly one goes with criticism on the other hand, I think that can could quickly uh, be be, uh, be cut off. Okay. Um, would you agree with that, boy? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, and Naveen, what what would you think about the yeah public opinion shaping narratives in in a European context? Uh, in a European context, I think there is. It's it's not the same as in China, obviously. I think there's the agenda is, as I said, decided a little bit, is a bit more reactive based on events. Uh, to what extent the government can influence it does vary a lot from country to country as well. But it is also quite honestly not at the forefront of discussions, especially on nuclear issues. So it's a bit cryptic, but <laughs> yeah, no, thank it does you. vary a lot. Um, one of our previous speakers, actually, uh, from webinar one, uh, esteemed John Isaacs, uh, from the Center of Arms Control and Liberation and Council for a Livable World, uh, he has a question. Um, I think I'll pose this to Naveen, if that's okay. Uh, he said, he said uh, what would it take for China to enter negotiations with the US and Russia? Will it take many years or decades for China to build up its nuclear forces? to US and Russian members. Depends what we're talking about though, right? If we're talking about a legally binding treaty, putting limits on a Chinese arsenal, binding it together with the US, with Russia, I wouldn't necessarily call it a pipe dream, but a very difficult objective to reach. So, whereas if we're talking about arms control a bit more broadly, if we take into account a lot more of the informal measures, crisis uh, management uh, type mechanisms, uh, which Brad has mentioned as well, risk reduction mechanisms, finding some agreement, probably more political on that. I think there is some progress to be made in the, in the next few years if discussions don't necessarily fall to the, to the wayside. But it is difficult. I think there are just uh, still a, a, a a growing gap in terms of threat perceptions. I think there's also too many red lines on either side. Um, can, a lack of transparency on China's side as well makes it quite difficult to to have a starting point, I think, for some of these discussions. I'm sure Brad can speak a lot more about um, the, the potential there based on his experience with the Track 1.5, Track 2 discussions, but th there's some, I think, uh, low hanging fruit that is possible but uh, we also have to be quite realistic as to uh, how nuclear questions do fit in, I think, broader uh, discussions, broader strategic issues that are being discussed between not just the US and China, the US and the West. So uh, it's not as central as uh, in the relationship between the US and Russia, for instance. So I'm, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I unfortunately am. And Brad, I see you nodding, shaking your head. Um, I'll, I'll be the pessimist. Uh, Naveen is, is too polite, um, but I think she's right. Uh, first of all, you know the Chinese have told us that they're not interested repeatedly. Uh, that is hostage, secondly, to the larger strategic relationship. Um, third, we often forget how long it took us to reach a deal with the Soviets back in the day. The Chinese don't have the experience, and they remind us of that every time the subject comes up. The vocabulary is not shared. The comfort with whatever level of transparency is required is not shared. We have just so much of a foundation to build and uh, a, an extraordinary reluctance on the part of Beijing to get pulled into a negotiation that it feels for so many different reasons is just not to its advantage. I think again, exactly as Naveen put it, that we'd have to expect, we'd be we, the thing to do is focus on low hanging fruit that isn't arms control as, as traditionally configured or anticipated 
but is all a series of confidence building measures, either unilateral and bilateral, that gets us at least to a stage where we can begin to really talk about uh, arms control or at least shared cooperative ventures to try to somehow build confidence in the relationship and to, if you will, reverse what are right now, I think some very unpleasant dynamics. <laughs> um, okay, so we have also a question from Henrietta that I would like to pose. Uh, it is, so Naveen, uh, you pointed out that non-governmental open source research in the US has been really important in bringing transparency to China's new missile uh, silos. Is China building similar expertise in open source investigations? And how does this relate to the growing field of open source research in the US and Europe? A bit off topic, but. As in, do I know if uh, Chinese expert or Chinese expert community is also focusing more on open source? Open source uh, verification. To be honest, I don't know. The, the Chinese expert community, the one I have contact with is quite, small it's not necessarily independent either it's quite government linked so i think the expert community itself i would assume they have an interest but um i would also assume uh, that the chinese government itself has invested a lot in not open source obviously but in its own uh, uh, geospatial analysis capabilities there's obviously still like a need for more information uh, the US, Russia, uh, other nuclear weapon states are a bit more transparent than China, but there's obviously a lot that we don't know that other states would very much like to know. So I'm sure they are investing in that. If the expert community itself has the capability of doing this independently of the government, I, I would be curious, but I can't speak with much uh, certainty on these issues, unfortunately. Thank you. We actually have a question. Um, for Boe in the chat. So um, you mentioned that people in China are reliant on the government to gain information on nuclear weapons. Um, and is there a, another space, um, an alternative space for educating people or is the party line um, on nuclear weapons the only line? What are your perspectives on that Boe? Oh, well, in China, uh, people mo uh, mostly get the information about, for example, nuclear weapons from the media. And it seems there is not an effective way in China to uh, maybe to, to space uh, the media now. Yeah. And would you say there are many like um, public spaces or like um, on Weibo, are there any chats for like civil society, for ordinary people to discuss um, their opinions on nuclear weapons? Yeah, people can, uh, people can um, discuss some of these contents in, for example, Weibo or WeChat or maybe some other, uh, such like Facebook or others, but it is not allowed to, to talk deeply about uh, maybe these issues, uh, such as the issues about national security. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think we have one final question. Um, so I'm gonna pose this to Brad. So um, this is kind of from a UK perspective, but I guess similar to many countries in the West, there is currently a lack of a clear policy regarding Taiwan. Um, a strategic ambiguity. How much do you think this strategic ambiguity contributes to um, instability between the two nations and the risk of a miscalculation um, triggering nuclear conflict? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, the argument in theory would be that uh, strategic ambiguity in fact dampens uh, the risks by keeping, by encouraging both sides to be cautious without knowing. And, you know, glass half full or glass half empty does, if, if, the, if the Chinese are, does it mean that the Chinese are going to take American ambiguity as, as 
in fact suggesting an inclination to to intervene or as an inclination to sit down to sit it out you know and it's it's uh, it's very difficult unfortunately these days to say i think though that um the american position has been increasingly clear that uh, we are prepared to defend the status quo uh, to help the Taiwanese acquire and, and the capabilities that they have to uh, to defend themselves, which is what the actual language of, of the Taiwan Relations Act is. Um, I think, you know, the, Taiwan is seen as many ways as a, a bellwether in some, uh, of Chinese intentions toward the region. And uh, the, the, you know, the larger set of dynamics is really just the way in which that the U.S.-China relationship is viewed, uh, first of all, as a U.S.-China relationship rather than as the one I framed it as, which is the West versus, if you will, Beijing and its, its uh, associated governments, the liberal uh, governments, if you will, and the degree to which they are prepared to um, pay a cost to defend a regional and global order. And do the, the degree to which they have an understanding of what that entails. And as best as I figure, and as I think about this a lot, which is why I have headaches quite frequently, um, it's, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty here. We're, we are, if you'll, if you'll allow me a moment, we're at a really fascinating moment in history where the realignment of politi global political and uh, geoeconomic, political and economic interests is shifting. And, we're not prepared. We in the West, those of us that have made the rules and set up the order are not prepared for ways to adjust this. And we are struggling to come to grips with this new reality and understand the distribution of capabilities, the interests involved, the determination on all the various parts. And we're doing this very ad hoc and very piecemeal. And my work on, on in terms of technologies and in terms of geoeconomics and uh, um, just the larger questions of deterrence and order are trying to make sense of this. Um, and it's, it's, it's a rich conversation, but unbelievably in show eight and very, very indistinct. But there's all of these conversations that we're having is a piece of it and only a piece of it. And it's precisely the understanding that so many, as I said, the assumptions about how the world works are just falling apart in front of our eyes. And we in the West have been slow to acknowledge the degree to which that is true, happening and what we're going to have to do to protect the values and protect the interests that we think are important. Um, it's a very um, florid answer that really managed to escape, I think, uh, giving you a solid response to your question. But, um, you know, this larger issue of nuclear weapons and power and um, order is just part of this much, much bigger discussion that we're um, all beginning to have and, quite frankly, doing a pretty poor job of. No, thank you. I think that was a really great way to to sum up um the conversation in the current state of affairs and hopefully that's why we think scrap um has a a great um solution to this um problem with um its treaty on disarmament um so on that note i want to thank um our fantastic speakers today for their time and excellent contributions um and thank you to everybody who's joined us today and just a quick reminder that the next webinar um on space and emerging technology will be on Thursday, the 3rd of March at 2 p.m. Um, and we will share the links in the chat. You can also stay up to date uh, with our work, uh, join our newsletter um, or follow Scrap Weapons on social media. A video recording will be available um, also on a Scrap Weapons YouTube channel. So thanks everyone. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks to the audience. Thank you. Good day. Thank thanks. you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much.